Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks for having me and thanks for joining. Today I will talk about diversity in open source from an Asian perspective. So this is agenda today. First, I will talk about why I chosen this theme. I will pre present some open source participation data and a brief history of open source in Asia. I will then share a list of potential barriers and ideas to overcome them. Finally, I will close down with a summary of key points. So let me talk about my journey to come here and my involvement in open source. I'm a senior program manager at VMware in the OSPO open source community strategy team. I lead a strategic alignment between our community contributions and our business strategies working across the organization. I was born and grew up in Japan, studied engineering, math, and physics at university. I joined a global technology company as a Windows software developer for four years, spending much time in Tokyo and Seattle. Then I had an opportunity to lead the mobile phone protocol stack development in the UK. At that time, I met my English husband and moved to the UK, where I led Linux and Android-based tablet development as a software development manager. This was my first contact with open source, working on Linux PSP, HDK, SDK, and entire Android platform development. Then I had a year out to look after my son, decided to change my career from telecoms to cloud because everything was moving to cloud. Then I had an opportunity to lead a large scale company acquisition program at Cisco. So this was a great move because it provided the experience of cloud technology and working across many business functions. Moving up to date, after leading multiple projects and programs, I've now been at VMware for almost three years. So how many people in this room from Asian countries? Just one, two, thank you. So Asia is the world's most populated continent with a great potential to become a driving force of open source. The continent is extremely culturally diverse. Perhaps everyone agrees that the open source presence is very strong in North America today, and the official language is English. As many studies show, a variety of perspectives and experiences create a richer and stronger community, and they produce more innovative solutions. And the organizations that has high DEI score are more innovative and 35% more competitive than the others. Many countries, companies try to promote and recruit a variety of people to increase their diversity. For open source communities, it is more complex. Although many open source foundations run a great number of great projects, to improve the community DI status, it takes longer due to its nature. So today, I'm going to identify possible reasons to prevent strong Asian participation to open source so that we can think how to improve it. So the source of this data from the Octoverse and the Linux Foundation DEI report. As the report says, the number of Asian open source developers is high, very high, and growing high. But we hear very little voices from them in the survey. On the ground, Asian representation in open source communities are still not very strong. As I often hear, many open source communities struggling to get strong Asian participation in their communities. As of today, many community leaders predominate from the US and Europe, and many open source surveys show low or very low Asian participation. So we have a great opportunity to reset the balance. 
Additionally, if you look more closely, we can see the participation from Asia is predominantly from China and India. Well, the region consists of over 20 countries, and they are positively engaged in open source, supported by organizations who recognize the importance of open source. So open source history in Asia started with Linux, along with the strong support by each national government. By early 2000, open source was not yet well recognized in most Asian countries. Japan was one of the early adopters of Linux and already started to adopt open source. With help from Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, many open source organizations were set up in Asian countries, as listed in the slide. Funding from the central government triggered and accelerated the spread and increased awareness of open source in Asia. And today, many open source conferences are held across Asia and country every year. I've shown just a few on the slide. However, I'm sure many of you have already attended them and many others not shown here. So now we know that a firm foundation for open source exists. Next, let's look at geographically, geographical and social factors that could impact strong participation in open source. I cannot talk for all of Asia, but I've identified some key reasons that could explain the limited participation today. In the last few months, I have interviewed a number of Asian colleagues, ex-colleagues, and community members and leaders. In the next few slides, I'd like to share my findings so that together we can think of how to improve the participation. Our ultimate goal here is to have as many matured open source communities across Asia as there are in the US and Europe. So time differences and limitations are significant factor in the participation within open source. This is common to all regions, and for some regions, it is the dominant factor. For engineers in Asia, unfriendly meeting times are strong barriers for community participation. The research shows more new members remain in the communities when they actually join the conversation and meetings, rather than just them making a com code commits and create issues. One of the steering committee members in India commented, lots of projects in the CSCF space have meetings that are too late for APAC regions. Personally, I've attended some meetings at midnight when I was starting my career, but I'm not able to do that right now. Not able to attend meetings means that I lose visibility. I'm lucky enough to have enough credibility in the community, but for those just creating out, this is a huge barrier to grow. There are also times when they, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. <clears throat> when I've missed late meetings and woken up to see decisions have been already made without my input. Although there is a challenge to organize the community meetings at sociable times for everyone, we need to be mindful and flex where we can. Another time-related challenge is having the time available for open source. In fact, most developers across all regions listed the insufficient time as the biggest barrier to contributing to open source projects. The situation varies if you are allowed to work on open source during working hours or not, or if you, if you can afford to spend time for more open source outside of your core hours. This will also touch the regional culture and other social aspects. I will cover this later. 
<coughs> the language barrier has been mentioned by nearly all of the people I interviewed. It is probably the biggest barrier for Asian people. Language can be also a challenge for other countries where English is not their first language. However, these country, those countries whose language is Latin-based perhaps find it less of an issue. Most people say reading and writing is not a problem, but it's still a barrier, especially when you are busy as it takes extra time and work, even with the dictionary and translation tools. Here, real-time conversation in English is a real challenge. When the spoken language is he heavily accented, when there is background noise or poor audio quality, or more than one person speaking at the same time, the situation can be worse. While translating in their mind, the speaker has usually moved on. The diagram in the right is a good example. In Japan, 98 residents are Japanese, so we rarely need to speak in English day to day. I've been working in the US and European country for more than 10 years, but it still takes some time to tune my ears into the sounds and vocabulary when I talk to people who I meet the first time. When I write emails and documents, I still use an online dictionary to choose the best words so that I can convey the right message. Quite often, I have a clear logic in my mind, but struggle to communicate my thoughts as clearly I, I would like to. So how about the other countries? India is known as the second largest English-speaking country. Excuse me. <clears throat> Their business language is English. However, this is not true for an all Asian countries. One of my colleagues said that they had very few participants from other Asian countries outside of India in their community meetings. One of the reasons quoted is that they might feel okay with written communication, but aren't comfortable with speaking in English in the meetings. In China, less than 1% of residents speak English. It presents a large communi communication barrier for many international companies. One community board member in China have commented, I've been working for an international company for over 10 years, where our official language is English. Based on my experience, language is the biggest barrier for communication, especially oral communication. And it would impact personal development and team collaborations. It is also the biggest factor stopping people joining open source communities. However, in recent years, the situation seems to be improved mainly for two reasons. Number one, more young people who are more comfortable with English due to having exposure to English movies and dramas and etc. Number two, auto translation tools, auto subtitle provided by Zoom. In China, it is also known that the document and communication is Chinese only for some open source projects, especially the products are developed for the local market only. There are some Asian countries who speak good English. For example, over 90% of people in Philippines speak English. But there also seems to be um, other factors behind language, like confidence, shyness, and felt of confrontation. So it's a complex mix, but cannot be easily resolved with technology and translation tools alone. The effect of a company culture, this varies and will depend on the companies their size, national culture, and industries. VMware is the US-based global company, 
and they appreciate the value of open source. It is a core part of our business strategy, so we have a strong open source culture. The companies I've been working in previously were similar, so I'm comfortable to be in this environment. Many of them tend to cont contribute with support and encouragement from their organizations. However, this is not the case for all. Employer support is important. In general, many employees don't have the time and energy to contribute to open source out of personal interest. An Indian colleague said to me that there are practically no companies who are willing to support their employees to work on open source in India. VMware and other tech giant company are the exceptions, but otherwise, if someone needs to work on open source, they need to work in their own time. This does not scale while well keeping work-life balance constraints in mind. This is a similar situation in Japan. Unless a company values the open source concept, they don't quite appreciate the employees spending time to contribute and the external community. There's another aspect in Japan. Although changing jobs is becoming more common, especially amongst young people, lifetime employment predominates. So many people don't find as huge benefit to build their skills and their reputation in open source communities as other countries. And building external relationships through communities is not so great value for them. Gender equity. Based on the number of studies, the majority of people in open source are thought to be still male. Gender bias is also one of the biggest factors that impacts the open source environment. Unfortunately, it is well known that Asian countries rank lower than the Western countries for gender equity. At the start of my career, extreme gender bias was common throughout the workplace. For example, when I joined the first company in Japan, we had a custom called tea duty, where on the monthly rotation, female employees have to go to the, uh, work very early in the morning to make coffee and tea for managers. Today's young generation cannot believe this, but we never questioned at that time. I also heard an interesting story from a female PhD student in China who actually participates in open source communities. When they select college majors and future careers, girls were always told that being a software engineer is a very tiring and stressful job, also requires logical thinking that the skills they lack for as girls. As a result, many of them won't choose to become a software engineer, even if they have pursued a master degree, but they will still enter this industry taking up products or operating roles. She also said that the society still expects women to take more responsibilities within the family, childcare especially. So gender issue is a sensitive and complicated topic in the current society and a large barrier to overcome. Social environment and culture are also important factors. I think characteristic tendency at a national level is one of the key factors in open source community as its culture is unique. So here I am not trying to stereotype, but we, are ha we have to admit that we have a different person. We, ha we have to admit that we are all influenced by the cultural behaviors <clears throat> of our nations as a collective. It is often said that the people in Eastern Asian countries are hardworking, shy, feel uncomfortable with conflict, especially in English communications. This is not always the case for those who were born and grew up in Western countries. 
One big factor is that the compared with Western people, Asians feel more uncomfortable in the very confrontational part of open source development culture. Asian people tend to prefer to maintain or seek harmony rather than risking conflict, especially when communicating in their second or third language. In these situations, it is often the person who speaks loudest who takes the credit with the more modest and humble contributors <coughs> being overlooked. There are other social factors, for example, education and political influences. Education. There was an observation that many schools still do not actively teach open source con concepts if open source participation is not an evaluation criteria for courses or further education. Students won't invest time in it. Also, there is no standard approach or curriculum on how to collaborate with open source in the public domain. Political inferences must be also considered. The research shows that despite the large number of GitHub users in China, there is a hesitation to contribute to external platforms as they use their own platforms, GitT, China version of GitHub. A community member in China commented, one of the important um, drivers behind the impression that there aren't many voices heard from Chinese participants in the international communities could be their different platform usage habits and network barriers. Although Twitter, Stack Overflow, and Slack are common across the world, many Chinese developers use their own tools. As per the October's report, developers in China were noticeably creating and consuming open source projects on GitHub but they still seem more hesitant to contribute to other repositories. Although seven and a half million GitHub users are based in China, more than eight million users also use Gitty. In other words, half of Chinese open source developers prefer to use their local tools instead of GitHub. Due to performance and cost, Gitty users are even actually increasing. There are also some political reasons behind, <coughs> excuse me, behind government. So it's a very sensitive and complex topic. Finally, this is a more subtle point observed by few members regarding the community elections. They commented that they've noticed there are more chances of someone from the US and Europe getting elected in open source elections over folks from APAC regions. For example, despite the very active contribution numbers in open source, there aren't many steering committee members elected from APAC, as they could not get enough vote. So diversity is complex and defined by a combination of multiple factors, including geographical and social factors. Open source is a community in itself, and it is strongly influenced by social behaviors. We cannot ignore that people who create a community are influenced by their own national behavioral tendencies. Relying only on community support from a specific region like the US and Europe will affect project scalability and sustainability in the long term. Open mindset is a key. We must welcome diversity and actively embrace our differences, collaborate, respect, be curious. And change has to happen at both sides. Asian people also need to make additional efforts. They need to be role models for open source culture and to lead others. Don't be scared of making mistakes. Be positive, find positives rather than negatives. Appreciate and differences. 
and this applies both those to include and to be included. For real global participation, we need to seek real inclusive cultures so that communities can actually benefit with the real value added. So now I'd like to invite the questions and also I'd like to hear how your community approach uh, these challenges today and or hear about other factors that could impact the participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hey, um, I better not stand up. So thank you for traveling here and thanks for the great talk. Uh, I would have one question from a security perspective. Um, after pr uh, providing the information about the lock for shell vulnerability to the Apache Foundation, um, it occurred to happen that um, Alibaba was chastised by the Chinese government. And one could uh, argue if this was a personal vendetta between Jack Mao and Xi, or if this is actually a law-based in uh, invention. Um, and thus, I would ask if you feel like this makes an impact on Asian security researchers uh, publishing, and how and what could be done to generate an avenue for them to contribute to the discourse. Yeah, um, it's a very good question, and uh, it's hard to answer as well. Um, is there any person in this room from China? Because <laughs> I was thinking about this, um, especially reading the recent news, and I think it's really, yeah, hard to answer for my, you know, me personally. So, but I think we have to. I mean, as I said in the last slide, it is uh, one of the things that the open source communities. Uh, shouldn't be influenced by the you know, intention of the government, specific government com countries' intentions. However, it is also the fact that we can't just ignore and avoid. And I, I'm sorry to say it, but I don't have a clear answer. But I think we should work with, do you have anyone working from that region in your communities? I think that start with, it's it's, I think it's important to talk with those people. You know, if you have any uh, friends or friends or friends or community members' friends, and if you have opportunity, talk with them. And they, I think it's a good start to find out and then uh, come to the solution. Because I think the open mindset, open source mindset, is common. I hope, you know, shouldn't be influenced by those um, uh, intentions. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned education and there not being so much uh, learning about open source in the education system. Do you have ideas or hopes or wishes about what you would want to see happen in education? Yeah, so um, in Europe and especially US, it's, I think it's quite common that we, say we have a you know, summer school thing and open source um, intentions, uh, you know, bring in the encouraging students, but it's not so common in Asia. So I'd like this to be common in Asian countries. And I think that from open source community cultural viewpoint, Asian countries are slightly behind than the Europe and US. So I think that is, so, you know, but it's coming and it's happening. And then, you know, I'm from Japan and I'm also the member of Japanese community, open source community. And then they are, you know, although their open source contribution is quite um, advanced in, uh, especially the Linux, you know, automotive that industries, um, their idea of you know needs of OSPO is quite behind. So there, there are there are many countries who contribute to open source but don't have OSPO and all that concept. So I think that is, but that's happening. So I think it's coming, and then you know we just sort of do the similar thing as it's happening here. I think that will help the students to encourage the open source community contribution. OK. Thank you very much for the mm -hmm. great talk. Um, you mentioned some of the struggles that prevent Asian communities from contributing to open source. Do you think these struggles are also the same that are preventing them from owning their own open source projects? Because 
the tech ability and the manpower is already existing in Asia, and like Africa, for example, would it would be very difficult to own an open source project? Do you think? Oh, it's own. The same reasons or own it just started. Uh, I'm oh, right, an, starting. An Asian open source yeah, project yeah, and yeah. be completely owned and welcome other contributions, of course, but starting it in Asia. Do you think it's the same barriers or there are more reasons that stopping that? It's an interesting point. It's because it's slightly different, depends on the countries. In Japan case, for example, um, as I said, I started to, I recently started to join the Japanese open source community and they are trying to create more OSPO, you know, trying to make OSPO more common thing because without OSPO, how do you do open source safely as a company? And those people, I mean, the company's culture are not quite catching up that concept. So that could be the reason why they don't try to open it and try to own and then build the com you know, ecosystem communities. Those concepts just don't exist in the uh, you know, company's leadership levels in Japan. Um, I, I don't know about the, all the other countries, but this is the example in Japan. So yeah, you're welcome. Yes, please. Hey, um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, um, so we we build two open source products, Taiga and Pempod, and over the past few years we have seen uh, Indonesia uh, rising mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. adoption yep. and activity, mm -hmm. like uh, like ranking high in, in GitHub activity. And I was wondering, perhaps linked to Ariel's um, question, if there is a specific Indonesian perspective that we can learn from. Or is it just that it, they have a huge population and, and that's it? Yeah, so some of the Asian countries um, are quite um, proactively in trying to involve the open source. And the open source is a great way to sort of grow your career. Because even students, you know, if you're not in the office, uh, if you're not working, you can just get started and involved as part of the community. And it's a great startup. And then I think that is quite, you know, there is a conference in Asia held in uh, um, South Asia. And that encourages, you know, and the more and more people trying to uh, take this open source seriously. I think that is the reason uh, that you can see so many Indonesian involvement. So it is starting, but not as quite as here and the US. So I think we, we should just carry on this. Um, thank you mm -hmm. for, for the talk and for sharing the, mm -hmm. this perspective. Um, one of the barriers that you mentioned was uh, time, specifically in relation to time zones mm -hmm. and stuff. I, I, I what kind of strategies would you recommend mm -hmm. for open source projects who have a lot of contributors in Europe or uh, in the Americas uh, mm -hmm. in order to better include uh, potential contributors in APEC uh, countries uh, to uh, participate in meetings either live or participate in decision making processes in, in some manner, um, mm -hmm. without someone having to, to have a me meeting at two in the morning. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, so I think, as I said, uh, there's no sociable time for everybody. So we need to have some sort of, you know, but we can flex. Um, I think the compromise, there are many ways to do it, but the one thing I was thinking is sometimes we have a community meeting time slightly different time, uh, which is friendly to, sometimes friend, very friendly to the US area and then more friendlier to the other, something like that, so we can, adjust the meeting time and also the community. We are trying to sort of capture all the communications. They're very transparent and capturing on the board and the GitHub or whatever. So that even for the people who are not participating in that meeting can know the, what happened in the meeting and how a decision was made. So this is part of the community strategy as well. So we have many ways to improve that communication transparency. Thank you. Okay, uh, one last question. Cool. Um, I guess first uh, a comment. You know, thank you for this talk. Uh, I worked for two years in an Arabic-speaking organization, predominantly, and so uh, the way you describe language and kind of how it affects you, mm -hmm. uh, how you act, I didn't realize it could be so, said so well. So thank you. Um, my my question is. Uh, when, when talking with these various people, um, 
Did you ever notice that like, oftentimes when we think about open source, we think about like existing projects that we know of, and many of them start in the West. Did you uh, come across many projects that were very common in Asia, but weren't really known about the West? And do you have any perspectives on maybe instead of how we're the main, like the Westerners are the maintainers and we're looking for contributors, how we can contribute to projects started in other countries? Yeah, so you're talking about the project started, in, for example, in China, and then to participate to that. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I know a couple of projects like that. Uh, in VMI, we have a um, VM-originated project, which are just happening in China area, for example. And uh, their interesting project community manager is based in Europe, and he's trying to sort of spread across the world wide, not just China, and he is trying really hard to, I mean, I haven't catched up with him recently, but uh, yeah, we are noticed, and then, you know, for example, I think the communication, the language, for example, if, we, if they just stick to their own language, then, you know, there are many people who understand English, but other way around, you know, we don't, m not many of us understand their language, Chinese. So I think we still stick to the sort of officially agreed role language and the communication tools. I think that is a good start. And then we should also meet and discuss and then know each other to start with and then start small and then sort of expand rather than just trying to involve widely. I think that is a good start. 